We want beautiful and the form matters, but it has to have function. It has to be able to create a place for us to swim, to engage, to connect, to actually enjoy and cool off from the summer heat and humidity that that Luke's already talked about. So those two things go hand in hand. This is episode 186 with David and Luke of Splash. Enjoy. Welcome to your go-to podcast for the pool and spa industry. My name is Tyler Rasmussen. And my name is Greg Diafania. And this is the Pool Chasers Podcast. All right. Well, thank you both for joining us today. We appreciate you taking the time to be here. Thank you so much for having us. We're excited to be here. Can you uh, introduce yourselves to listeners? Luke, we're going to start with you. I think a little bit of youth before age and experience. Yeah, well, your story will take longer, mate. You do have a decade or so on me. So, um, <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. boys, thanks for having us on here. I, uh, my name's Luke. I am a pool industry sucker. I, uh, I've been in here for my whole career. So I'm uh, relatively young, although there's younger now, isn't there, gentlemen? But no, look, I've been in the industry for 17 years. Started uh, packing salt bags and moving, moving acid boxes around while I went through and did a bit of university. Uh, from there, I mean, th- this industry kind of just grips you by passion if you want it to, I guess. But like, I, I love what I was doing. You know, we were maintaining people's dreams, making people happy. Um, seeing people swim in the water is just so awesome. So I discovered this passion and saw all these people making actual lifelong careers out of it. Like, you know, roll back the clock that 15 years and, you know, I don't think anyone... Maybe they did. Maybe I was just young and naive, which is probably true as well. But, you know, making lifelong careers out of the pool and spa industry. So, you know, I started to see that that's how it could work. So at at, at 20, uh, I opened my own pool shop and went out on my own, which was super exciting. Uh, Ran my own pool shop for a bit, but discovered that I did not like the retail life. And by that, I mean working seven days a week. Uh, So I was a newlywed as well. So I, I shut the shop down and went to work for uh, one of Australia's largest suppliers or the OEM manufacturers uh, in customer service. Shuffled around a bit there, but was there for five years in a couple of different regions in a couple of different roles, you know, from sales to customer service and a bit of tech work as well. Uh, and then I went to work uh, as a national dealer manager for one of the big fiberglass pool manufacturers here in Australia. Uh, then I had a small hiatus in the finance industry, but don't worry, I didn't leave the pool industry. The whole point was to finance pools, basically, and help people get into more pools, which led me to here, uh, where we now get to chat in this capacity. So I, uh, yeah, get to work for the Swimming Pool and Spa Association, and one of those things we get to do is run a couple of different media brands, like this one called Splash. So it's an honor and a privilege to see, you know, the magazines that I, I grew up, I like to say, in the industry reading. Uh, we get to, yeah, talk about and, you know, even have conversations like this uh, halfway across the world. I mean, you guys know this is the best industry in the world, right? You've heard the podcast. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> That's right. Is that how you introduce yourselves in Australia? I just asked you to say your name, man. I'm like, <laughs> Mate, this is, this is how it works, man. Dude, hey, I love that. Most of you are just right like, to it. yeah. You know, you you get the whole your name and then you know Dave could say his name and then we could get into mm-hmm. the nah. stories. But you just went. Nah, nah. That's it. That's nah, Australian look. intro. Hi, your, I'm whole, David. your whole life. I've been a pool holic now for <laughs> coming on twenty years. And, and it's the Aussie <laughs> intro. But I figure, guys, for any of those listeners out there who have listened to our podcast, I've got to get a word in before before I get taken <laughs> over. So you guys may not hear from me for the rest of this podcast. <laughs> wow. Wow. So far, the evidence would prove quite otherwise, I think, uh, Tyler, Greg, that Luke is the motor mouth amongst us and none of us have got a word in. Hi, what's your name? And we got a a, a full uh, biographical data detail that none of us asked for, but thanks. Love it, Luke. Um, So since we're, you know, on the topic, love to know just a little bit more about you and, you know, what was life like growing up in Australia? I mean, were you surfing, skating? What were you doing growing up? Ah, uh, look, I'm a fat boy, so balance isn't my uh, strong suit. You see, so Me not too. my kind of thing. But I was, uh, I'm uh, more of. I hate to let you down, too, Greg. But no, I'm more of a you know football, as in. Have you guys heard of a sport called rugby league or rugby league or rugby union? They are. Uh, I've so heard of rugby. They're, they're, 
It's like a it's like a better version of the NFL, from what I hear. So, um, no, look, they were the sports that I played: swimming, tennis, no that kind of thing. <laughs> super, super outdoorsy, you know. So, um, great upbringing in Australia. Great culture, you know. You you play out on the streets until the 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 street, street lights light. come on, and then dinners and in, inside ready to go, and then you come in and you know wake up and just go ride bikes the next day. Been pretty. Uh, pretty great upbringing, I got to say. Very good. Have you ever uh, been to the U.S. before? No, and I got to tell you, and I tell a lot of different people this. I don't, I don't have a travel bug as much. You know, I don't, I don't really care about seeing the sights of Europe or what is wrong you know, with you? going to Antarctica or any of that. But damn, I like the U.S. is so appealing to me. Like Ooh. it is the only place that's on my bucket list in terms of international travel to go to. Like I reckon. I just reckon it's the best place. I'd love to, you know, spend six months there just in a camper van and almost, you know, Chevy Chase style, just driving across the country, <laughs> just stopping in and seeing different things. Chasing That's the girl crazy. in the Ferrari, yeah. <laughs> That's crazy you say that because Australia for me is uh, the only place I care about going outside the U.S. <laughs> so I'm not into the other stuff either. But mate, if I'd we love can, to we spend can time there f- doing a swap. We could go swap. Freaky Friday, Podcast. Tyler. Yeah, <laughs> let's podcast swap. <laughs> <laughs> please do please well, do. thank you what about luke for me please <laughs> thank you luke uh let's hear about you david well it was uh you know elvis had recently died in 1977 it was a sunday morning it was hot the sun was up it was early and uh i burst into the world and uh the rest is history what else do you want to know um now i grew up in a city in the south called melbourne so luke uh, grew up where we both sort of reside now in a place southeast Queensland, still on the east coast. As we uh, as we swim in the Pacific Ocean, we're looking out, and if we look northwest, really, really hard with a strong pair of binoculars, we can just see uh, San Diego and La Jolla uh, off in the distance. Um, but it's a it's it's a fairly long swim that one. Um, I think so you might I be looking up- at the wrong uh, island. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> past Hawaii, across the state line, it's out there somewhere up to the northwest. You know, you know, you guys think you're you know sort of down towards the south. You're not. We're in the deep. We're in the real south. We're in the deep, dirty south. Down We're the here. dirty south. Yep. <laughs> and uh, and as far as that goes, I was I was from the south of of this country. So a city called Melbourne, a uh, big, vibrant. Uh, type of city you might have seen the news at the moment for the Australian Tennis Open that's being played there around Novak Djokovic. All a bit of fun that one. Um, so that's that's my home city, capital of uh, entertainment, music, education, and sport, or so they call themselves anyway. Uh, it's probably uh, not quite any of that really, but that's what they think they are. And so that was my um, that was my experience growing up. So any sport that we could get our hands on, but there's typically a sport. I don't know if you guys have heard of it. And your listeners should look it up. Uh, Aussie Rules Football AFL played on basically a round field uh, with four sticks at one end, four sticks at the other end. If you kick it through the middle sticks, you get six points. If you kick the ball through the two sticks on the side, you get one point, and that's that's our basically national game. And it's it's huge. You know, you get a hundred thousand people. Uh, to a game, it's you know equivalent of your NFL probably um, here and certainly in Victoria, which is the spiritual home, I suppose, in Australia of of that game. So that's what I grew up uh, loving. That and sounds playing. like the game from Harry Potter. What is that? Quidditch. 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 I reckon. I reckon you're not not far off. You know, I compare the excitement of AFL though, as you know, we shorthand it to AFL over here. It's about as exciting as synchronized swimming. No, see, Luke's grown up in the wrong part of the country and he doesn't understand intelligent sport. His sport that he talked about, rugby league, you know what happens? You get tackled five times, one tackle, two tackle, three tackle, four tackle, five tackle, pass the ball to the other team and they can have a turn now. And like anything that requires any sort of intelligence, like like your NFL, um, you know, there are millions of different plays that you've got. There's a lot of thought. Everybody plays their their part, very strategic, and it's an intelligent person's game. Look, let's let's go easy on Luke today. We won't throw him too much under the bus, but just probably worth you knowing that that that's where he's grown up and where he's from. We just need to be a little bit careful. 
uh, around him. Make sure he can keep up with the conversation. Hey, that's you, David, going hard on him, not us. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the way we show love for each other in Australia. Just giving you a little bit of cultural insight. That's 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 the highest form of respect is abuse. That's also that's also the nicest thing David's ever said to me. <laughs> <laughs> that's fair, sir. Um, now, look, I grew up in Melbourne. I studied in Melbourne. I actually studied to become a school teacher, and I was a school teacher, and I lasted three years, and it was the same thing for three years in a row, and I went no. Um, I'm bored after this for three years. What am I going to do? And decided, um, speaking to some older blokes who I knew and looked at and went, I kind of want to be like you in 10, 15 years. What should I do? And all of them said, go and get some commercial real world experience out there and learn how to sell, learn how to add value and learn how business in the real world actually works because you're living in a little bubble as a teacher, which turned out to be some really great advice. So uh, I worked my way through a couple of different uh, companies quite quickly in an education area uh, and basically did very well um, in, in sales and moved up and through quickly uh, and then found myself at an airport and had a conversation with a couple of blokes from the pool industry, which I'd never considered before, and they offered me a job. And uh, that was in 2006. And here I am all these years later, I've spent many years in chemistry. So working, selling on the chemical side, on running a retail brand uh, in this country. Uh, also had a time where we've got uh, a qualification, we call them certifications, Cert 3, Cert 4s. And we might cover that a little bit later in the conversation, but, but basically uh, recognized pathways for industry when that first came in a number of years ago. I was doing what's called um, RPLs or recognition of prior learning for people who wanted to have all of their knowledge recognised and therefore get a certification that was also recognised by uh, Australian government. So I spent time doing that, introducing that, that training into our industry. And then like Luke, uh, was invited to be a part of our Peak Body Industry Association here called the Swimming Pool and Spa Association. Uh, we're in Australia and New Zealand. And we've been, um, well, I've been in that since 2017, and it is my awesome pleasure in that role to run Splash, um, which is our brand here. It's a B2B, it's a trade brand, and it's, you know, we've got a massive trade show in June. We'd invite all your listeners down under here to the Gold Coast, the beautiful Gold Coast in June, uh, to come to our trade show, um, but everything B2B Splash and then we've also got another brand called Pool and Spa, which is aimed at consumers and it's expos as well and magazine and website and all of these different avenues. And it's, it's a whole lot of fun being able to promote, grow and protect our industry, both to professional trade uh, people, but also to reach a consumer and see uh, more people engaging in more pools more often in more ways. And, uh, and here we are. Love it. Yeah, I appreciate you bringing that up. You know, I wanted to just touch base on that brand Splash. Can you talk a little bit more about that and what that is? Yeah, look, Splash has been in existence in this country. It was owned by private hands um, when it started about, oh gosh, it must go back 22, 24 years now. And there was a, a real need in the market coming into the late 90s in Australia to uh, to unify a brand. So we had associations or peak bodies that sat sort of state by state, but there was no brand that sort of overarched and represented um, industry to industry. Um, and Splash, you know, saw an opportunity, the owners of Splash saw an opportunity to do that and create these trade shows, create these brands where the industry could um, celebrate its innovation, bring their innovation, present it to industry and, and, and be seen and and develop and, and grow. And it became an international trade show quite quickly um, with all the, the big brands that you'd expect supporting that, Fluidra, Haywood, Pentair, um, and so on, uh, being a part of that amongst many, many others. And, you know, some of the innovations that you might be unaware of, just taking a slight rabbit hole that have come out of Australia are things like salt chlorination, uh, things like fiberglass pools. Uh, so there's, there's things that have been innovated in this little part of the world here that have gone out of here. We, we are a swimming culture uh, here. And so therefore there is innovation and sometimes isolation, which we are, we're away from the rest of the world. You know, those storybooks you read when you're a kid and they say once upon a time in a land far, far away, it should just say once upon a time in Australia, because that's where we are far, far away. 
Um, and so there's innovation. And so for us to create a, a, for you know an industry brand for for B two B for business to business started. Now, fast forward, uh, sort of 17, 18, 20 years, the industry itself, state by state, that had these industry peak bodies sort of broken by state lines. Same way in America, you've got your your 50 odd states. We've got the same here, split across um, states and territories, and every state runs slightly differently. Well, that changed in 2017 on January 1, where an association, those states essentially merged together and became a, a representative as a peak body. And that peak body um, purchased um, Splash and bought Splash into the hands of the industry for industry. And it became my job uh, and my absolute pleasure to run that and represent industry. So I get to sit um, with, in the boardrooms here in Australia with all of those big brands and, and talk about how we can promote them and grow the industry here in Australia together. And so it's been four years, sadly, because of uh, the C word, because of COVID. This should be a drinking game. Every time we mention that, we should have to take a shot of something. Um, but it's been four years since 2018, since we were last able to run our trade show. That's coming up again in June. Um, but the brand itself, you know, it's web-based. We retarget um, our, our audience. The audience is growing and more engaged than ever in this part of the world. Um, so it's it's a terrific brand, Splash. And Luke and I, out of uh, some of that momentum and need just to keep things going uh, and, and want to uh, I suppose, take on uh, new strategies and, 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 you know, where the future's heading. We took on a podcast uh, about 12 months ago. And so that's where the Splash podcast uh, was born from that brand to continue finding better and different new ways to keep our audience um, excited, informed and, uh, and growing. Yeah, Thank cool. you, David. I, the podcast is amazing. We love it. Splash Magazine. I actually remember stumbling on Splash Magazine in this app called Scribed. And it actually has documents like PDF documents, magazines, all kinds of crazy things that people upload, audiobooks, books. And I saw the magazine in there and they were some older issues, but flipping through it, I just thought the content, the photos, the information was really good. And um, once I saw that, I was like, man, hopefully one day uh, we can have some people that, you know, represent this magazine be on the show. And here we are today. So everything is, uh, is good. But, Thanks for having us. Yeah. But one question I have is to the trade professionals in Australia that are digesting the Splash magazine, the podcast and all the other things that you're doing, how do they benefit from the content you're, you're promoting? Luke, do you want to get a word in here? Yeah, no, thanks Please. for having me back on the podcast, guys. Yeah, it's good. I told, I told you guys at the front, I had to, I had to front load the, I had to front load my talking because I never get included. Just answer the question. He took off to go play a little rugby and he's back. Hey, hey man, I, I, I could have played five like, and the game was over. I could have played two. I could have played two. I could have played two rounds of golf in the time that I haven't spoken, and I'm not very good at golf. Uh, look, so focusing on the trade and, and speaking you know, in this format is we need to rise as an industry. We need to be better and we need to know more than the average punter who owns a pool or a spire in the backyard, yeah? So the language that comes out of the magazine, whether it's new techniques on how to do something, whether it's new technology that's coming into play and innovation that's coming out there, whether it's looking at new methods or learning uh, or promoting new products that are coming through as well. That's where the trade starts to benefit from this, uh, from the content that gets pumped out across all of the media channels. You know, it, it's it's keeping up to date with the happenings. You know, it's it's very easy, particularly as as we come become more and more confined over the last couple of years, to to come down into your granular circle where you know you're only talking to your mum and dad, or your your spouse, or your kids, or your your dog if you have no kids, or you know a fluffy toy. So it's important to remember that it is bigger. You know, we, we've got a lot of, of pool technicians who, uh, you know, one man in a van, or I term them polies, yeah? They put a pool pole on the back of their ute or their van and off they go. It can be so lonely in those situations. You know, they're, they're, they're not connected in terms of, you know, being thrust upon in terms of uh, material from bigger supply. You know, they're, they're out there by themselves. So there needs to be a channel where they can tap into to, to gain knowledge, to gain um, 
community, I guess, at the end of the day. And that's, that's what Splash is about as well. It's being part of that community. So we need to educate and, and include everyone. So that's where the content starts to come through. There's also, also things where you might go you, different business cycles. Yeah, you might, be, you might have capped out where you are in that one particular business cycle and want to expand or pivot across to you know, a different sector of the industry. And that's where you can start to learn and seek out those opportunities within those magazines. So, yeah. Uh, I love that. And obviously you're doing something right because, you know, this is something we're going to get into is the Australia pool and spa market is extremely um, aggressive and progressive and has been doing that for a long time. I've been watching it for many, many years, probably, I don't know, five, six years, just looking at everything, even from like the pool fencing, all the regulations and how even the information um, you know, where people can get, you know, educated and all the different things that are going on. It's pretty incredible. And it seems like the, the people doing the work, the technicians, the pool builders, all of those people, all the subcontractors, they must be on board with the message from the manufacturers and you all, because they're, you know, adapting to the new technology and all these different things. So I think that's uh, really cool. And we have a lot to learn from you guys in this episode. Awesome. Awesome. We can't wait to have you on ours to learn from you about your methods and the way that you guys do things over there. Secret sauce. (laughs) Yeah, look, it's interesting thought, Greg. And I I think sometimes what travels is what you see is sort of the best. It's like when we look back over time, we think in terms of nostalgia and, you know, weren't they the good old days? And sometimes, you, you, you know, you can filter out what was the bad Look, we're like any industry here. We've got a good, better, best. Um, a lot of the cream in it does rise to the top. There have been some incredible innovations that come out of here. And as a whole, um, we do have, a, as you said, a very progressive, in some ways aggressive industry that wants to keep growing. Um, we've also got a consumer who is, uh, you know, we're in demand from consumers here like never before over the last couple of years. We cast our mind back to early 2020 and sorry to raise COVID again, everybody drink. Um, we thought, you know, in March that our industry was going to tank. This might have been the end. Um, we all sort of had that big lump in our throats, that sinking feeling in the pit of our stomach, deep in our cockles. And then come May, June, all of a sudden, our, our builders here uh, are booked out six, 12 months in advance. Uh, and we've been in in real demand. but. But yes, we are an industry that wants to wants to grow. That's why you know it's been so great from not just a Splash perspective, but from from the group or the association, the industry who owns Splash. So the the peak body from Sparza to protect, grow our industry, to have supportive industry. The suppliers are on board with that. Uh, so many of our our industry um, categories, I suppose, in it. We're not just an industry that builds pools and then that's it. We don't just dig holes, put in some Rio, uh, you know, tie some steel, spray some concrete, put some coping around and we're done. That's, that's not our industry. That's a big part of our industry. But where everything from design and concept to construction to maintenance to supply of equipment to continuing to find ways to better uh, enjoy and find ways for our consumer to engage with pools. And that's the support that we've got around Splash as a trade brand. But it's the support that we've got from industry to represent and advocate to governments for things like training and education to make sure that there's pathways uh, for people that are recognised to have long-term careers to attract and retain uh, good people to our industry rather than a brain drain going elsewhere um, into home construction. Come and build pools. Come and be a part of the best industry that there is. So, no, I appreciate your, um, your, your perspective. Um, yeah, you're looking outside in at our industry, Greg. It's great feedback. You're very welcome. We're going to take a quick break. When we get back, the boys share what to expect when visiting Australia and the significant role that pools have in the Australian culture and lifestyle. Hey, pool pros. My name is Zach Singer. And I'm Bryce Sarain. We're here with Beyond Pool Cleaning in Scottsdale, Arizona, and this is your Skimmer Tip of the Week. So, back in 2017, one of the main reasons we started using Skimmer was for automated service emails that it sends to our customers after each service stop. And since then, we have done a lot to really get the most out of them. Oh yeah, it starts off as a nice recap of readings, dosages, and checklist items. 
but there are several options to really take it to that next level. Customizing the default message in the service emails is a game changer. This can lead to so many great opportunities. Remember when we updated it to promote the variable speed pumps and we sold three in the first week? Yeah, and giving our customers information about pool chemistry and CYA so they understood why we recommend draining their pools occasionally. Not only educating, but communicating. Like how we let them know when we're going to be offered Thanksgiving and Christmas? My all-time favorites when we started the photo contest. Right, we challenged our team to add a personal touch like adding photos of the dogs or making sure the pool looked great. Then you noticed that a really good looking photo got forwarded to our customers' friends. So we had to add referral messages as well. We had a lot of fun with that one, especially when our customers took notice of the extra effort. Just another way Skimmer helped us market to and educate our customers. To find out more, check out episodes 138 and 154 of the podcast, or go to getskimmer.com forward slash pool chasers. That's getskimmer.com forward slash pool chasers. Before we get into any more talk about pools, um, what could people expect if they were to visit Australia in terms of climate, uh, personality? Everyone's getting a little taste of that right now in terms of what they can expect from uh, personality wise. But maybe you can give people just a bird's eye view of what it's like to live in Australia. I'm going to start on that and throw to Luke. And what you've heard today and I'm going to start at a, 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 a little bit of a cultural level. We are we are what you'd call a very egalitarian um, here. You know, anyone who wants to rise up or be a tall poppy, we don't handle that really well often in Australia. It's probably a weakness and a blind spot maybe in our culture where the USA seems to celebrate risk and those who take risk and get their rewards. We want to cut people back down to our level. And that's that's admirable in one sense and it's friendly and it's inclusive and it's great. Um, but then another, when we cut people back down, who've actually taken some risks and succeeded, probably don't get the, the honor and respect that they deserve for carrying, um, and, and getting that reward. But, but in a, in a big way, so you, you won't see on work sites here, the use of Mr. And Mrs. Or sir or ma'am, uh, what you'll get is, is mate or first names or shortened surnames. Um, and it's very egalitarian, whether, whether you're one, two, three, or four steps above a CEO down to somebody who's working on a factory floor, you're not going to get a yes, sir, no, sir, um, from that factory worker to a CEO level that doesn't exist in this country in that way. And that can be confusing to some people and has been seen as disrespectful. It's not, it's just a cultural, uh, again, just a level playing field, uh, in that way. So, you know, when Luke and I give a little bit of banter with each other as we started this off, we, we probably need to just frame that in the sense that that's just us um, giving some banter, but I couldn't have any more uh, respect for the quality of uh, man Luke is and what he brings our industry and the role that he does and the support that he provides uh, my role and our industry and all that he does. Uh, he is absolutely an incredible bloke and uh, he's an absolute pleasure to work with. So I hope no one's taken that the wrong way. Luke, I'm going to hand over to you, man. Thanks, mate. Thanks. Uh, so we do, we do have a, a level of honor uh, among peers here. And I suppose, you know, to answer your original question, Greg, is in Australia, everything is trying to kill you. Not, not the people, <laughs> but the animals, if that's what you're, if that's what you're asking. So no, look to, to be serious, Australia is, is a, is a wonderful place, you know, from the beaches to the bush. Uh, it's, it's so different and can change, you know, within minutes, not, not minutes, probably hours if, if we're honest, but you know, most of, most of the population does live near the beach. I think it's 85% live coastal. Uh, and there's this big spans in the middle uh, called the Simpson Desert, but a beautiful place to explore the whole of Australia. And you, know, you can be sitting at the beach and then uh, three hours later be just driving across plains of red dirt. You know, we've got the Outback, the Aussie Outback. You guys may have seen that kids movie on, on Netflix lately. I think it's Escape to the Outback. It's, it's, it's actually a pretty cool movie. You know, we've got wildlife. We've got agriculture. Rescuers Down got... Under. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Kangaroo Jack. <laughs> man, you're, showing your, you're showing your age there, Greg. <laughs> Rescue is down under. Come on, man. How that good. stuff. I just tried showing clear. my kids that movie. It did not go over very well. <laughs> Let's be clear. Probably the movies not. make it seem like that's just across our back fence. It's like you guys driving from Phoenix to Chicago far um, mm. is, is sort of the distances we're talking about to get out to these regions and these zones, the <laughs> other side of, you know, mountain ranges and stuff. But... You know, it's not as close as you think. We, we're, we're a big spot. We're not that far off the size of the continental USA. What, look, what it's probably worth 
as well, just explaining, is I've had the pleasure, where Luke hasn't yet, of being to the USA a couple of times. Uh, one of those experiences for me that has blown my mind is when uh, you're up in the air flying sea to shining sea, and I look down, and you know, for a little while you're flying over the the you know Utah and Arizona, and you're seeing the the the, the, the red uh, rock formations and over the Grand Canyon, then you're flying over the beautiful Rockies of of Colorado and so forth. But everywhere else, there is either cropping or towns or cities everywhere across your nation, um, and that is not replicated here in Australia. As Luke said, we're very coastal. We're pretty much 85% East Coast. And our population is not 350 million. It's less than 10% of that. We're about 24 million. And, you know, that's the population. If you drive from the border of Tijuana and San Diego to the north side of LA up to the Getty um, Museum, you've got about that many people in that little corner of your country as we do across um, the size of our nation. Now, having said that, bringing it back to a pool industry and a culture perspective, we are water babies. Uh, One in five households here has a pool. Something like 96% of our population knows how to swim. Uh, We are engaged with water. You fly over any of our major cities, particularly where Luke and I are up in Queensland, and you look down and you see uh, backyards full of blue. Um, So we are culturally a swimming uh, backyard pool culture. And now we had a a very successful swim school on the show, the Hubber family, and they mm-hmm. spent many years in Australia and they just had the best things to say about how much, you know, everybody in Australia cares about like swim safety and teaching the kids, yeah. like pretty much when they're born, uh, how to swim yeah. and all those different things. So that's kudos to you guys. Before you get in the water. <laughs> yeah. No, that's not insane. So much. Maybe, Maybe for, for, here. Maybe for no, swim but- schools. I, yeah, I, national I just campaigns, wanna... hey, Luke, we've had those national campaigns, you know, do the five. Our kids grow up singing water safety songs um, on from from TV and training. So, no, you're absolutely right. Luke, I cut you off, man. Just I just want to highlight, you know, Dave's 58 this year. And oh, I mean, he looks, he looks great whoa. for 58. But my point is that he survived this long without getting killed. So, I just look know. 58. I'm 44, <laughs> you youthful the people youthful people we still man. age well we don't all get taken out young but we have like i think we have 12 of the of the seven major wonders of the world right we got the great barrier reef have you guys heard of that you guys know the great barrier reef oh yeah what about mm-hmm. fraser what about fraser island beautiful yeah fraser, Nick, i don't know what yeah. that one is but we, i mean fraser, we've fraser probably island. we've probably seen it but mate the apostles down on down on the great ocean road down in you know victoria you guys heard of that? Negative. These are not no. natural wonders of the world. Mate, these they are natural wonders, wonders of Australia, of Luke. You're yeah, turning no, it no, up. You're reaching. The time. You're reaching. Pre- that's it. You guys. <laughs> you're, you're making a stretch here, Luke. <laughs> I, I know I'm right. making a stretch, but I started with a stretch, and you guys just didn't pick up, and I said, we've got 12 of the seven major I wonders of the world. So, yeah, yeah. And they're all I just thought you were still drunk from last night. <laughs> <laughs> we are getting some random. <laughs> not on weekdays. I was just feeling it. No, we, we've, we've got wonderful places to come and see. So, and yes, nothing's going to kill you. You'll be okay. Yeah. Come and visit. Well, and we're pretty, we're pretty visit. laid back in terms of culture as well. The people here are yeah. typically, typically pretty chilled out, especially if you go to the coasts or the beach or, you know, those surfy towns. It's, it's very, very relaxed, you know, hang loose, chill out, surf, skate, Greg. Um, yeah, you know, there's a lot of that, a lot of, lot of ocker people over here. Very good. Um, so, re- what role does a swimming pool and spa play in the Australia market? I mean, you just touched on Huge. quite a few things about, you know, kids at a very early age know how to swim, but you know, how do, I can only imagine if you're taught how to swim at such an early age that it just becomes a part of your lifestyle, you know, for almost the rest of your life. So, you know, what role does that play in most people that, you know, live in Australia? Absolutely huge. It is Unequivocally, if you are going to list, you know, the top five Australia things that that make us Australian and culture, water would come into that. Whether it's the backyard pool or the ocean, it would be water and swimming and being engaged. So it is a huge part of our cultural identity um, as Australians. If you don't have a backyard pool, you know someone that does. Uh, you grow up around it with the barbecues, the family parties, and all of that stuff. Um, 
you know, bombing and Marco Polo around the pool. And it is a huge part of our cultural identity. Uh, we, it's really interesting here now, we are seeing more and more um, ads on TV or YouTube. Uh, you know, it could be around finance or insurance or, I don't know, a, a, a meat or a selling a barbecue or something. And so many ads now built around a swimming pool. Um, here, sort of recognising that, that that's really become part of our, our culture and the great Australian dream. That's interesting. Yeah, so, you, so you're just now starting to see those ads shift towards that? I mean, more than ever. So about, I think we always did, yeah. but there's been, a, there's been a marked increase in the last two years, but it probably goes with the fact that our, our the demand for our product um, has gone up in the last two years as well. Um, and probably marketers and advertisers again starting to realize uh, yeah. to realize that. And Greg always talks about that, like you know, every scene of every movie or every you know commercial or TV show is like start around a pool. And, you know, it's interesting. yeah, dude. I mean, yeah. since the since the fifties, I mean, it was every Coca Cola yeah. ad, Pepsi ad, you know, anything that they could somehow back up next to a pool. Mm-hmm. Believe me, like you're gonna see, you know, bikini shorts, you know, in the swimming pool for sure. Yeah, yeah, and, and uh, highlighting on that too, I think, yeah, specifically around the lifestyle, banks in particular, finances have been focusing on on the refinance side of things to get yeah. that lifestyle, to get that pool. But I think, you know, when you list your house, if you have a pool, it's always the hero shot. The pool is the hero shot when you're trying to sell a house, yeah? So mm-hmm. it is, number one, the most important part of a backyard. I mean, it's not just backyard pools, it's commercial pools. You know, people swim for fitness, you know, and that's part of people's well being and their and, and their wellness that, that we swim for fitness and we swim for fun. Uh we swim for healing as well. You know, hydrotherapy is, you know, a major form of making people feel better. So it's it's central to to the way we operate. You know, I've got I got a five year old and a two year old and we've we've recently moved into a house that has a pool uh, in the backyard and Guys, we've been we've been swimming every day, twice a day since you know September, and just it's it's central to our family. It breeds that sense of lifestyle, but also brings us closer together. It's an activity that brings people together. So it's colloquial with the Australian lifestyle to have a pool. You know, we've got we've got Australia Day coming up on January twenty six, um, and uh, you know most parties will be poolside or at the beach. You know, that's just how it is over here. We all flock and somehow migrate to water we're like trees yeah we look for the water source and just head there i think that's incredible because i don't think even as many pools are here in the u.s i don't think most people use them that much and maybe that's from you know not knowing how to swim at an early age i don't know but i know in all the pools that we took care of and even you know i have a pool and we don't use it you know twice a day nowhere near as much as i would like to it's kind of a, a pain in the ass sometimes, but I think that from all the pools that I see in Australia, there's a lot of, uh, they're visually appealing. You want to be next to them. You're drawn to it. They're built, um, for function. There's all kinds of different things going on. I mean, is the visual part of the pool just as important as, you know, a habit of swimming your whole yeah. life? Yeah. Look, form and function matter. I, I kind of want to touch on something again around that that cultural um, difference or identity around Australia. It really struck me a few years ago when I went to, uh, as I said, we've got Splash, our trade show is the biggest in the Southern Hemisphere, third largest in the world. But I was at the largest trade show over in Piscine in Lyon in France. And I was invited to uh, basically three hours worth of seminars around pool. And the French being French, um, they create meaning from everything. The water, you know, we, we must discuss how it works, the flow of the water. What is the deeper meaning to us about this? And so those three hours of the meaning of, of, of water, I would have got sat through probably close to a thousand different photos of swimming pools. And they were stunning. They were beautiful. They were artistic. They were inspiring. But it struck me that not in a single photo, and not a single part of the discussion of three hours about swimming pools did anyone talk about swimming in a pool. There was no pictures of people swimming. There was no engagement with the water. 
It was all about the form and nothing to do with function. Now, flip that on its head to the complete diabolical and diametric opposite to Australian culture. We are really, we, we want beautiful and the form matters, but it has to have function. It has to be able to create a place for us to swim, to engage, to connect, to actually enjoy and cool off from the summer heat and humidity that, that Luke's already talked about. So those two things go hand in hand, Luke. Yeah, I, I think I'm keen to build on that as well from the form and function perspective. I mean, we all swim for different reasons, right? Like if I'm me, my exact scenario with, with two young kids and family around, we swim, one, to cool off, two, mostly to uh, make sure the boys don't have enough energy so they stay awake all night. But, you know, we, we have a big pool, and, and that's awesome. Other people will have a small pool because they just want to sit there and, and have a glass of champagne. I admit I'm envious of that because relax sounds awesome. But, you know, we all swim for different reasons. So that function point is so critical, and yeah. you'll find that it's one of those questions that, that a lot of our pool builders ask initially of going, what are you going to use this pool for? There's no point having a stonking great pool if there's two of you who are just going to sit in it and look over the beach, you know? It, it, it is about that function of it and, and how it looks. So, you know, we, we sit by the water, we eat by the water, we swim in the water. You know, even when it's cold, we heat the water so we can swim in it. Um, hell, we even cool the water down sometimes um, so we can swim in it. Uh, that function piece, it, it might have spa jets. It might have... Um, swim jets built into it because we've got a fitness addict who wants to use it for exercise uh yeah. we might put chillers on it we might have anything you know it could be shallow we've got pools guys that horses use yeah race horses have pools custom built for them so they can do their hydrotherapy there's a there's pools out there that have treadmills in them over here i gotta see this oh my so God. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's wild but you know Man, that's, that's where that's where i think so much everything links back to that since it's, you know, so ingrained in the Australian culture from such an early age, you are, it is truly a part of your lifestyle where here, I feel like it's more of an event. Even if it's in your backyard, it feels more of like something you would plan to do where you just do their second nature. I mean, there's a, probably a lot more, uh, you know, self-conscious people here uh, in America that are like, I'm not going swimming because I don't look right. You know, a, a lot of, you know, modern day culture has a big role to play in that. Whereas we're trying to look like the people on TV and how they look by a pool or all these different things where I think truly in Australia, that's the big difference is we just, this is our lifestyle and we just, we just do it. We're not thinking about other things. Come on in. The water's fine. Um, that is, that's where it's at, you know, and Luke and I look, look just on that, that sort of body image front, Luke and I proudly celebrate the bot, the dad bod. We are the dad bods and, dad uh, bod. you know, that's, oh, it's becoming more attractive now. Like just, just, you know, Embrace get the shirt it. off, get the budgie smugglers <laughs> on, get in the pool. Let's go get a banger on a sanger off the barbecue, grab a beer and there in the go. water. We're going to take another quick break. When we get back, we discuss what has kept Australia as a world leader of innovation and the difference in our country's priorities when it comes to a pool. This episode of the Pool Chasers podcast is brought to you by Leslie's. As a pool service professional, it's important to have the right partners. Leslie's values the important work you do to serve your local communities, and they want to help. With the new Leslie's Pro Partner Program, you can take advantage of the benefits only Leslie's has to offer. As a member of the program, you will get customer referrals and wholesale pricing. Additionally, you can take advantage of Leslie's extended hours during the week and on the weekends. When we were running Brothers Pool Service, we often used Leslie's when we needed supplies, especially on the weekends, and since they have over 900 locations, they were convenient to get to. They also offer free in-store services like water testing and cleaning repair. To learn more, check out episode 151 of the podcast, or stop by your local Leslie's store today to sign up for the program. This episode is also brought to you by Aquastar Pool Products. Aquastar Pool Products is a leading maker of VGB-compliant drain covers, but also offers many other products to the industry, including skimmers, deck drains, autofills, cleaners, mosaics, ozone, chemical feeders, spa jets, and fittings. Now, Aquasar is proud to announce a new addition to its lineup with the launch of the Pipeline Cartridge Filter. The Pipeline Cartridge Filter, which is available in two different sizes, was designed with the pro's time, safety, and comfort in mind. It delivers top-notch hydraulic efficiency, along with best-in-class filtration performance 
approaching that of DE filters. And these claims are backed by NSF International Certification test results. For more details, ask your local Aquastar sales rep or visit aquastarpoolproducts.com. That's aquastarpoolproducts.com or click the link below. So how do you think Australia has kind of stayed on top, you know, as one of the world's leaders in innovation for the pool and spa industry? I think I'll, I'll jump in, Dave. Uh, it's my turn, mate, here. Uh, look, we're, we're constantly challenging the status quo. Like, um, yeah, have you guys heard that old adage, if you need something done, give it to the busiest person out there? Have you heard that, that phrase before? Mm-hmm. I, almost, I almost think that there's a level of that, but on my side of things, it's got to be, if you want something done, give it to the laziest person out there because they're going to work out the easiest way to get it done. So, you know, yes, there's smarts to it, obviously. And I say it tongue in cheek a lot of the time, but you know, half these developments like uh, advances in engine, uh, manufacturing or advances in automation, they're just working out better ways or faster or more efficient ways to get something done. You know, so let, let's take automation, for example. You don't have to go out and turn your pump on anymore. You can sit here from your computer or your phone and jump into the app and switch it on. Now that's innovation that's stemmed and, and breeding laziness, but it's awesome. Like I'm, I'm annoyed that I have to go out and switch my chlorinator on, you know, or, or, or the cleaner. Like I, I've got a suction cleaner at this point. You know, I have to go out and make sure that the, that the throat isn't blocked up versus, you know, robotic pool cleaners these days, which you can turn on from Wi-Fi, and it tells you if the basket's full and you go, got to go out there and do it. But you know, it's, and, it's not being so cheap. Right, right. If anyone's listening out there, <laughs> invest, I, uh, invest, I, invest in your pool, Luke. I, uh, I'm trying, mate. I'm trying. I'm just a young buck trying to get by. Okay. <laughs> I, but see, so this, I think, is, this whole conversation going. is so crazy because your guys' priorities are totally different. Completely. You know different. what I mean? That's why. Because people that are listening to this, they all know about variable speed pumps. They know about all those things, but it just means so much more to you all because. The consumer is probably very, they're well aware of this technology because you guys have done a great job in getting that information um, over to them, which is something we probably need to be much more aggressive with. But everything you're saying, it just, it all makes so much more sense now why things are the way that they are. So I think, can I talk to that for a minute, Luke? Yeah, yeah, sure. It's when I started in 2006, we circle back to where this conversation began. I came into this industry from outside, from, um, from different business, um, different industry. I was staggered walking into retail pool shops uh, where even owners would be completely underselling. And the fear was we don't want to oversell. We don't want to oversell because they'll never come back. Hang on. If you undersell and don't solve a problem, your clients will never come back. And so I started measuring databases on what was active, which clients on these databases, and this is across um, hundreds of retail outlets, which stores and which clients were coming back. And in most cases, um, about 5% of anyone's database was truly active where they had visits of more than four times a year back to their shop. And then you start digging a little bit more and you find out these guys are the ones who are spending the most, not in total just because they're back, but on each visit. And so it began a conversation for me and I think it's spread not from me, but I'm sure there are other people making the same discoveries and working with industry to say, look, you've got someone coming in doing a water test and you're selling them in this country because we're salt chlorinated. Uh, often a bag of salt that you might make a couple of dollars um, on margin and five liters of acid and you're making a couple of dollars there. So you've made about a $4 sale. It's cost you about you know 12 to $15 in time and everything else to make that sale. You're running at a loss. This, this doesn't add up and you're not solving a client's problem. And so what, what began to happen from sort of 2010, 2011 was as these new technologies started to be developed, um, like, uh, like uh, variable speed pumps, for example, um, our, our industry started to do a much better job of selling on value, not on price, that these variable speed pumps are going to do a far better job for you over time, uh, running more often at a lower cost and creating a return on investment that's going to pay off for itself in this time rather than uh. 
And so our industry began to change and it was from people like myself, like Luke and many other industry professionals from supply side at that stage who could see what was going. And our industry um, through some of the big franchise groups as well started to see that and, and sell a far more profitable model. It's where we used to have uh, retailers say, I can't sell a bag of salt for $10. I can't sell a bag of salt, 20 kilo bag of salt for $10. Can't sell it. It's too expensive. It's got to be $6. The hardware shop sells it for four. Now they're selling bags of minerals that are half the size for four times the price because the consumer um, is being sold on value of what those minerals are delivering. And so it has been a shift, Greg. It hasn't always been like that. It's been over the last 10 years and five years, probably more rapidly in this country, that the retail or, or professional trade who deals B to C to the consumer has really changed and seen that there's better options that are a win for their business, their margins are ongoing as well, as for a consumer uh, and giving them a better experience and selling on value. And that's, that's extended to things like from suction cleaners for $250 to $2,000 robots uh, or you know a myriad of, 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 of other things and automation and better lights and so forth. So it has been a change, Greg, that we've seen here. So I have a quick question. Are pools accepted and the understanding of swimming pools in all classes of people in Australia, whether it's, you know, uh, the working class, blue collar, white collar, low class, middle class, high class, whatever you want to call it, because that is another huge difference where um, a lot of the technicians maybe that go to work for uh, a pool service company here in the States a lot of them have probably never even swam in their whole entire life, but they have to do chemistry and they're doing all these different things. So I am curious about that. I didn't want to forget to ask. Great question. So yes, is a short answer. We've got a, you know, any solution, I think we've got, and, his, and this is historical as well. Yeah, yes, it is. Um, I would consider it a, a dream to own a pool. I would also consider it very accessible if that's particularly what you're looking for. Yeah. So we've got, we've got, uh, above ground pools. Yeah. Vinyl lined above ground pools, um, pop up pools or, uh, pools that you can buy from, you know, the kind of your major marketplaces where like you, you could go and get a blow up pool for 50 bucks if you wanted to. You know, it's not going to be your in ground pool that you're going to put in the ground and have the beautiful form that we it talked about earlier. But I would say, yes, pools are, are very accessible. We've got pools ranging from, you know, three grand, if you like, that, you know, a small uh, above ground pool all the way up to, you know, being the signature of the backyard. You know, at, I think there was one, I was talking to someone the other day, a backyard pool that was going for like half a million dollars or something like that. So, you know, it, it yes, is the short answer from vinyl pools through to precast plunge pools, through to fiberglass pools, through to beautiful uh, design feats of pools. Yes, pools are, are highly accessible over here. What about like community pools? You know, I mean, there's most people don't even have a thousand dollars. You know, a lot of people in the world are living paycheck to paycheck. Is you know swimming pool safety education? Is that something that's even taught in say, you know, elementary school? I mean, yeah, what is yeah. that? Yeah, look like yeah, definitely, absolutely. So kids uh, learn to swim. Uh, so schools will take them, uh, you know, usually during term one or term four, which is sort of the summer end of, our, of the way our school calendar works, uh, and get them lessons. So our kids typically are having at least 10 lessons uh, a year throughout primary school or what you call elementary school from, you know, age five to 12 um, every year, so cool. uh, even if they don't have a backyard pool at home. Uh, they're learning to swim and being put in little groups as well. So it's definitely part of the culture. Yeah. We probably don't have the, 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 the expanse in the same way you do between wrong side and right side of the tracks um, here as well. We've got a different sort of safety net. Um, our, our, we pay higher taxes and there's probably more safety net for, for different people as well. So that access to a $1,000, um, you know, put it you together yourself pool in the backyard uh, is, you know, achievable in a lot of cases in those sort of lower socioeconomic areas. And often those lower socioeconomic areas, um, when you're on the East Coast, they're in the Western suburbs, a little bit further away, the sun bakes on them and they, they're desperate for, for that water as well. So 
that's become a big thing, that type of index pool here yeah, as inflatable, well. Yeah, inflatable, yeah. Yeah. Very cool. So you guys had the pool work CEO, John O'Brien, on your show, and it was an incredible episode. Probably listened to it three or four times. Highly suggest it to anybody that, you know, wants to hear more information on it because very successful entrepreneur and you guys asked a ton of good questions. But he had mentioned a few things that, you know, we noticed and that was when he brought the Poolworks franchise to the U.S. market. He touched on a few things. And the first thing that he said was less than 10% of U.S. pools have salt chlorination. I mean, that's pretty crazy. How has the Australian market been able to, you know, adopt salt chlorination so well? It's 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 been over here and, and quite prolific for a long time, I would suggest. Like I've been here for probably 16 years and, it, and it's been very commonplace over here. Less so in, you know, bigger commercial pools, though that is starting to shift now. Salt becomes a really good option because if you've got a control unit there anyway, like if you've got timers running your pool pump, for example, and you've just got a, a salt cell there that's actually producing chlorine to sanitize the pool, then it, it, it kind of makes sense outside of it's, it's something that doesn't exit the pool or get consumed by people swimming in the pool, yeah? The only way that salt will leave the pool is through fresh water coming in or dilution, fresh water coming in. So w- what you've got is, yes, you need to go to the pool shop and buy salt when the test says so, right? But we don't have to lug around liquid chlorine. You know, the, the, the days of tipping in or manually adding liquid chlorine uh, periodically are gone. You know, so we don't typically walk around in, in bleached shorts anymore or you know, go to church on Sundays and then come home and tip a liter and then ruin your good church shoes. You know what I mean? So that, that, that's been a big part of it. But also, you know, we've highlighted at the front end, I guess, shipping um, over here because it's such a big, you know, ge- geographically a big spance. So to ship, you know, drums and liters of a chemical that's relatively low in active constituent versus having something that's always there and can just perform this continuous cycle of electrolysis. It's been something that people have jumped on. Now, and, and Dave highlighted it earlier from a, from a retail perspective. It's really, we're a solutions-led innovator. So we've got options where, you know, typically it was high salt. You know, we've got low salt options now as well, where it's getting close, closer down to your kind of your TDS levels that you wouldn't usually maintain in a, in a freshwater or a liquid chlorine pool. So it, it's just been something that people have, have adopted to. It's, like I said, it's been around, and quite prolific since I've been in the industry. Like I, I can't remember a time where it wasn't the majority of sanitation that I was selling through the retail or that was getting sold through um, pool builders at that time. If, if I look out the back, there's a lot of pools in my particular block. And, and, and I look around and there's only a couple of pools that are still hand dosed, you know, that are off timers that are connected to an independent circuit. And I suppose that's another intriguing part and probably part of uh, the adoption, if we like that term, of going, I, I, I'm led to believe, and, and I'm, I'm intrigued to know more, but in the US, a lot of, most of the equipment, I believe, is hardwired, if that phrase makes sense. Like it's hard connected in and, and, and hardwired into the circuitry, whereas most things over here are plugged, are plugged in. So you know, it, it's easy to have a general power outlet by the pool that you can just plug a salt chlorinator into and then you pump just plugs in to a GPO in the bottom of that chlorinator. So it's been that kind of natural thing that you can just plug it in. It's not intense as a practice to have to get the electrician out to wire in this kind of equipment. There's no extra trade involved. It's, it's put the box here. It's got timers built in. It's got your sanitation built in and it can actually control your filtration as well. So that's probably a large part of the adoption of it and why it's been successful um, we've got a lot of good local manufacturers as well who are able to manufacture it at, you know, at, at, at a rate that people can purchase it and, and do adopt it and put it on. Yeah, no, that's amazing. And, you know, you've been able to, cause we have a problem. We're so used to using chlorine tablets that now they're extremely expensive. They're not as safe as salt, all these different problems that we're having, you're not having to deal with in Australia. 
So, and it's- so you're putting tablets in feeders mainly or floating devices? How's that work? And what type of tablets, when you say chlorine tablets, you're talking dichlor or trichlor? Or typically what are you, like three-inch three inch trichlor tabs, right, in a floater. In both. Yep. Yeah, seen them both. Okay. But mostly, More yeah, just plastic one. floaters in the pool. Yeah. yeah. So, and then when someone wants to go cheap and puts a Cal Hypo tab or something in there with uh, with mixed out chemicals and we've got all sorts of issues, yeah, kaboom. <laughs> but but what, yeah, about, you know, what, about, what about when you hit those moments where your stabilizer goes through the roof from using the trichlor and you get chlorine block? What do you guys do then? Yeah, that's See, a big but problem. Here's the, this is probably going to be somewhere in the title of this show because our priorities aren't the same here. Even the people that work for pool companies, you know, it could be totally wrong, but I don't think they equally have the same understanding of the value that the swimming pool has. And therefore it's kind of like, what's ever, whatever we've been doing, what's available. If it's chlorine tablets, fine. If it's salt, yeah, throw it in there. If it's that, and I'm not saying that people here are that reckless. I think some can be, but you know, it's all about priorities. We totally. have not adopted and swimming pools, you can say what you want about it being a part of your lifestyle, uh, being in the business of pools and the act of swimming being a part of your lifestyle are two completely, you know, different things. And I think that's why you see some of the greatest coaches of all time were usually, you know, a player um, and they had some level of success. And I think it goes the same way. And I always thought this a long time ago and I pressed myself to swim more or at least be in the presence of water or just be in it, submerge myself. Because I was like, man, if I can truly understand this feeling and healing and all the things that it provides, it's just going to make you, uh, it's going to make you understand, you know, this business a lot better. That's good, man. So I'm, I'm intrigued. David dropped a, a term before, which is fairly uh, commonplace over here. Uh, and that was using the phrase mineral pools. Have you guys like, does that is like, is that something like we've got, we've got salt chlorinators. Yeah. And that's, that's the question that we focused on. Dave highlighted earlier um, in one of his center, uh, in one of his comments about mineral pools. So, you know, what just like salt is obviously sodium. Um, but where we've, we've got blends now that have, you know, magnesium chlorides, um, among other things, and potassium chlorides, sodium tetraborates, and that kind of thing, which bring a whole nother realm to the feel, Greg, as, as you just highlighted, the feel of water, you know, like, um, th is that something that's, that, that you guys know about, or is that new, or? Yeah, so we're familiar with minerals and the different products that are out there. I don't know if this is what you're, you know, getting at, but I don't know of any pools that are solely relying on minerals. I think we have mineral packs and what? Polar X and Blu-ray Blu XLs, um, you know, that are like an addition to the pools. Yeah. But then, yeah, we don't call them mineral pools. I've never really heard that term as far as. Yeah. Luke, what percentage of new pools you think going in at the moment for, for us would be going straight to that mineral solution where, where it's still a salt chlorinated pool? The process of electrolysis is still creating the chlorine over the plates in the cell housing, just, you know, very quick. Uh, lesson on the way salt chlorination works but with all the minerals in luke every conversation i'm have you're a bit closer to the builders but it would be well over half of pools going in and going straight to a mineral solution now aren't they uh let, let's let's just use the phrase alter uh, alternate um options for sanitation and that's because you know, we've got a lot of systems now that we're, we're combining salt chlorinators with with ionizers and i realize that's not new technology but it is yes. becoming more and more um mm -hmm kind of important as very good as and and, and you know like we keep we, we circle around and that's the beautiful thing about everything that we're going to talk about here it's all kind of interconnected because well mm. it's a it's a fluid there you go back to the water back to the h2o it's all a fluid <laughs> situation yeah like it comes out of the function of it like we've got a lot of these things were kind of engineered around particular people or, or groups where swimming may not have been that enjoyable you know if, if you've got eczema, for example, swimming in a chlorinate, a, a pool with a high chlorine level is going to irritate that. So that's often left them on the sideline, yeah, or the side of the pool. Or if you've got, um, take my wife, yeah, blonde hair, uh, all that kind of stuff. If she's got a pool that has a level of magnesium chloride or potassium chloride in it, 
that's going to help to soften her hair or soften mm-hmm. her skin rather than, you know, the sodium or, or, or the liquid chlorine that, that, that can leave you a bit stinky and that kind of thing, or your skin a bit dry. So uh, a lot of these solutions that we're talking about have been engineered for people as they continue to seek out ways that they can enjoy their pool more and more often. So to answer your, your comment though, Dave, on, on a percentage, I would say, yeah, it's probably up around the, the, the 40 to 50 that are looking for alternate or additional sanitizers, you know, and that can take the form of ozone, UV, ionizer, mineral pools, uh, and and that kind of thing. So yeah, fascinating, fascinating uh, comparison. To your point, to your point, Greg, I think, you know, that's nowhere near the number (laughs) here, right? That's a, it's an afterthought or an extension or an addition, right? That, that only probably the higher class people use here. You know, maybe the salt pools obviously are becoming a little bit more popular because of price of chlorine, um, but it's not really pitched the same way. It's not, it's not given to the homeowner that same direction of the benefits of it. It's just kind of an additional piece. I think typically for builders to make more money in the past is what it's been, right? Of uh, additional of here's something cool you can put in your pool, but it's not the same type of you know acceptance or or deliverance there. And get them line items up. But, yeah, exactly. That's um, kind of what, I mean, that's kind of the truth. It's, you know, if it's not, if you don't explain really, it's just on the ticket. <laughs> yeah. Now, where that's changed here now, where that's definitely part of the win for the builder, um, but then you've got, I mean, the suppliers really have been behind developing this through the builders and then to the retailers as well. So supply side, those OEMs who are making these products um, have done a really good job of um, of positioning it and doing the really the the push strategies out through the the industry and the pull strategies in from consumer and yet that that number of forty percent that Luke's talking about you know five years ago it was nothing like that it has changed dramatically there where that message has got to consumer now you start to see it in real estate now you know uh, when they're talking about the house and the home and the pool beautiful mineral pool. Um, included so mm. it's, it's become a, a a consumer buzz thing here now as well but it's it's taken time and I, I think it's an interesting, interesting point too ty and greg that you raised there in in terms of just just another line item and i think that's that it's an interesting point because a lot of these a lot of these have been consumer-led solutions uh, uh, most of the time yeah yes yes it is an option and yes it often does have a higher price you know or an additional cost but they, 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 they're more focused on the solutions for what they're going to use that particular pool for. So it's an interesting, to me, an interesting mindset um, there or mindset difference between going, it's an add-on so we can make more money. Yes, it does cost more money, but it, it's about the value that's attributed to it or the solution that that's providing and, and the, the nice feeling that the hair or the skin or the enjoyment that's going to come from adding that solution to the pool. Yeah. No, and I'm all about line items. Don't get me wrong, but I think, but I think you truly have to ask the right questions and know a homeowner yeah. in what to suggest to them. Because once, say, I might get to know a home, homeowner, I'm like, why the hell did they tack on all this bullshit? They don't even know what this mm-hmm. is. You don't even right. need it. You don't even know what it is. I don't even know what question could have prompted them to even ask you to put this <laughs> on this pool. You know what I mean? It's right. Like, Right. Yeah, you're gonna need six shop vacs back here, or whatever the hell else they can think of to to put back there by the pool equipment. Pumps. Yeah, <laughs> put a waterfall back here by the by the equipment pad. But um, anyway, um, another I think you're, thing you're just that, getting at like that that really that you really want to embrace that more in the U.S. Right, of like just you know understanding yeah. that you know it's instead of it being a line item, we should be you know taking on those kind of what, what they're for and, and utilize them. Well, Continue. just understanding their, their lifestyle. I mean, here are right. all the different designers, especially in not just swimming pools, but understanding mm-hmm. the clothes that they wear and the boutique mm-hmm. hotels that they visit and the museums that they go to and how they complement each other and the different, you know, shutters and blinds and tile right. choices and flooring and all these things and how it's supposed to reflect the backyard. And I look at a ton of Australian architecture and backyards and front yards and driveways and all the different pavers and door selections. And, you know, even the iron typography that goes on, you know, the side of the house, 
all of these things, that's why it looks so perfect to me and beautiful Mm -hmm. is because it is so thoughtful that when this person that dresses a certain way and does things a certain way, that, that when they roll up to their house, this is an extension of them from as soon as they see it down the street to being in the house and being in the pool and every little thing that they do is an extension of them. And to me, that's totally worth it. And that's, that's what it should be in, you know, all the things that we do. Great. So I want to get into a couple of these other things that you talked about with John and you don't have to talk about each one of them because it's beginning to be very clear on what, what is going on over there and his priorities is also saying that he is insanely surprised at, you know, the level of sophistication in the backyard when it comes to, you know, not just the, the salt pools, but also, you know, the pumps and the filtration and automation and all those different things. But he was talking about the pumps specifically, whereas I thought, you know, we had uh, done well on the uh, uh, variable speed pumps. But the way he was talking about it, it seems like there's still quite a few pools out there that, you know, don't have it. You know. I think if a comment on that, it, it's, I think it comes down to a lot of, I would say the American engineering and the American manufacturing of it because your crap just doesn't break down, gents. Like that's the thing. Like, you know, what I've, again, limited understanding and I can't wait to ask you guys more questions, but over there, the heavier a pump is, the better it's considered to be, right? Because there's the, the, often means there's better materials in it. Sometimes it means someone's just lumped a whole lot of lead in there. But if there's heavier materials <laughs> in it, it, it's probably been manufactured a fair bit, you know, better sometimes than other materials or, you know, different componentry has been put in. So perhaps it's just down to the rotation of um, the equipment there in terms of it hasn't broken down yet. Therefore, I don't need to replace it yet. It might also be along the lines of repair costs, you know, labor is fairly expensive over here so to change Mm -hmm. a set of bearings or to do a mech seal and bearings um is obviously labor intensive or rewinding a pump you know that used to be commonplace but all Mm. those kind of repairs are fairly labor intensive and over here that's a significant cost so Mm. it starts to change the conversation uh and the percentage of repairs versus just i'm just going to chuck a new one in and then the change becomes a lot different because if you're all of a sudden not just doing bearings and a mech seal for, you know, $250, $300, and you've got to get a new single speed pump anyway for, you know, $800 to $1,000, and it's only another little jump, you know, oftentimes to to get a variable speed pump, it's a big jump, don't get me wrong, but the, the value in the variable speed pump is saving your electricity and also not just wasting hours and hours of, of you know, time that you've pool doesn't need to be turned over necessarily because you know oftentimes it's done Mm -hmm. for the the sanitation of it so you know it becomes a a, a different conversation when we're versing new versus new because the repair is three quarters the cost of a new pump anyway so um yeah i I suppose i'm taking i'm I'm answering a hypothetical question here because it's yeah it's a bit bit of a different conversation i'd say Yeah. I mean, this is the, this is the huge difference. You, people are going to care more about the pool if they're actually swimming in it, opposed Mm -hmm. to uh, just looking at it. That is always going to be the biggest difference in the pool business. If you're actually using a swimming pool, of course, you're going to want the variable speed pump. Of course, you're going to want salt. You're going to want all these different things. If you're in there once, twice a day, because you feel the water, you look at the clarity, you want to open your eyes in the water or whatever it is that you want to do. Um, you know, it's just totally different. Um, the other thing was he was surprised by the weekly service model, which I thought was pretty crazy. Is there nowhere in Australia where they do weekly pool service? Um, so there, 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 there is, there is. And I think I probably half answered the question just before in terms of labor. Uh, the labor cost over here is, is quite high. Therefore, some of the service costs are quite high and difficult for majority of pool owners to maintain a weekly maintenance, you know, service schedule. So that that could have something to do with it. A lot of ours will be, you know, along the monthly schedule or, you know, sometimes fortnightly. Uh, and it may, this may talk, 
Is he uh, fortnightly? For every two weeks, fortnightly. Yeah. Um, I never heard that one. <laughs> okay. That's cool. That's cool. Every I like that one. Every, every fortnight, every two weeks. It's not a video game. Uh, it is it's spelt people. differently, but I, know. <laughs> I never heard You've that. You've never we, we heard the term bi- fortnight bi- to weekly, describe yeah, two bi- weeks. Weekly, there you go. Bi-weekly or bi-monthly. Yeah, I've never wow, heard Wow, fortnightly. It must be, we must get that from our, uh, our English forebears <laughs> and it's, uh, it's held here. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Just no, no, that's, that that's, 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 go ahead. I love that. Continue your no answer. Idea. So that, that may have a lot to do with it. It may also be in terms of priority. So, you know, given a salt chlorinator, for example, is sanitizing the pool and kind of taking care of that at a, you know, a consistent uh, rate, it may not be that, you know, we need to make sure the pool is sanitized weekly. It may be that it can extend out for a month and, you know, unlikely that something's going to go wrong. Um, yeah, I don't know. That it's it surprises me that it is as regular where you guys are because yeah, I suppose we only know what we know and what we've experienced. Yeah, so you know, coming up through the ranks, it, it was mostly monthlies, a handful of fortnightlies, and then very rarely, you know, the weekly. Interesting. Very interesting. Real quickly, you mentioned uh, the OEM model right versus distribution. I know you want to. Can you just touch base on that? Like what the differences are between that? Because it's some probably a term. A lot of people haven't heard. Yeah, we're a little bit different over here uh, in the way that our our industry, who's at the coalface with consumers, purchases their uh, the supply of their stock to to sell from uh, from trade. So, my understanding in the US is it's far more distributor based. So your Pentairs, your Haywoods, uh, Fluidras, and so forth don't sell direct to the trade. They sell via distributors and distributors then have their little flaws and networks out working with, uh, working with Correct. Our industry yep. who then sell onto the coalface. Well, we do have distributors here uh, and they do a very, very good job. And in fact, their influence might probably be growing, um, but that hasn't been the traditional form over here. It has been Haywood have their own um, field sales staff. Pentair have their own field sales staff. Uh, they all, these manufacturers typically have their own field staff and they sell directly and work directly from OEM brand to the, uh, to those retailers, to those builders, uh, as well. Now they're not selling direct to consumer. They don't extend that far, but they do to the trade. So in often traditionally the distributors, uh, have had a smaller role to play. I think that's possibly changing the distributors we have here do do a, a very good job. Uh, for our industry and manage lots of brands and often carry all the spare parts and all the other bits and pieces as well. Uh, but it is a, a, a different model traditionally, Luke. Yeah, I think there's a number of reasons for that as well and, and not least of it being volume. Uh, over here, we have a much less population, obviously, uh, which means it is easier to maintain that level of accounts, if you like. Um, to be able to service, you know, the, the trade specifically. Um, and, and like Dave's highlighting, distributors absolutely play their part in, in accessibility and training in having a range of products that a, lo- a lot of people will access. But yeah, the field team staff of those, you know, original equipment manufacturers um, does make up a large portion of our business. Yeah. And, and I think that's, you know, there's one, well, there's a, there's a definite few in the US that have, you know, so much size and so much scope that, that you guys have, one of them, I think, has more distribution centers than even the largest OEM in Australia um, across so. the US. And I think, to me, I would just put it down to market size and ability to service those markets. A bit like, a bit like the reason, you know, distributors don't go direct to the public. Uh, mm-hmm. they, they can't service that amount of, that volume of inquiry that's coming through. Sure. Interesting. Yeah, thank you. Definitely dive down that some more with you guys. Different time. <laughs> Looking forward to it. So how can people reach out to you to you know, listen to the podcast or get the magazine or just find out more info from you? Yeah, great question, Tyler. We would love to hear from you hearing from us. Uh, so you can reach out on the interwebs at uh, splashmagazine.com. And then because we're Australia, you've got to add the .au for Australia. So splashmagazine.com.au. Also, and, and within that, you, you'll find ways to uh, just to register for getting our e-news and an e-copy of the magazine. If you want anything else, just contact us through there and we can be in touch as well. 
Um, yeah, so we'll put all the links and show notes in the podcast for you. Um, but we really appreciate you both joining us today and we look forward to many more to come. It's been an absolute pleasure, gentlemen. Thank you so much for, uh, for bringing us in. Thank you so much for having us. We really appreciate it. Hey, Pool Chasers. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoyed the episode. To connect with today's guests, including pictures, links, and resources from everything discussed today, you can visit the episode page at poolchasers.com or click the links below. To connect more with us, you can find us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter by searching at Pool Chasers. If you would like to support the podcast, the easiest and most effective way is to subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube, as well as share the show or your favorite episode with a friend or on social media. Also, you can get early access to each episode by supporting us through Patreon. We know your time is valuable, so thank you for sharing some of yours with us today. See you out there, pool chasers. chasers.